Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, she said you were fortunate. There are those that might believe quite the contrary is the case. Uh, I see already some volunteers for that part. Today we're taking up House Bill 6, Education Finance Reform, which came out of a PED report. And actually, I encourage you all to go online and take a look at what is, in fact, the largest, I'm going to say most nuanced, sophisticated, PED report, it certainly is their largest they've ever done, a deep dive into how we fund public education in North Carolina. This bill, House Bill 6, by the way, is the same bill as Senate Bill 9, which was filed uh, by Fouché, Fouché, excuse me, McKinnis and, and Cravick over in Senate, and it's now parked in their Rules Committee. What a surprise. Uh, the purpose of this bill is to establish a joint legislative task force to study various weighted student formula funding models and, and develop a new funding model for elementary and secondary public schools in North Carolina. Last fiscal year, the General Assembly appropriated $8.4 billion to K-12 public education, approximately 39% of the entire state budget. We do so based on a system of allocations or what many of us refer to as silos. When you do pick up this report for PED, included in the report are going to be the handouts that I put down everyone's desk, which shows some 37, I believe, silos that we use to allocate K-12 funding. Examples of those silos are classroom teachers, textbooks, administration, children with disabilities, low wealth, small county, and that just names a few. Again, I would recommend you take a look at this. these handouts to indicate just how, I'm going to say complicated, some might say sophisticated, the system is. Some allotments are by position, some allotments are dollar, and frankly that's a concept unto itself that's not fully understood by many legislators, so let alone the public. This bill creates a joint legislative task force on education reform that will do the following. First, review current allotment system and study in depth various funding models based on a weighted student formula versus an ADM or allotment formula. This committee is to determine a base amount for funds necessary to cover costs of educating a student, to identify the student characteristics eligible for weighted funding, to determine the amount that base funds are to be adjusted based on those student characteristics, and to actually make a decision on which of any funding elements should remain outside of the base funds, and then study other issues that come before the task force that are relevant to this. Task force is to consist of, in this bill, nine members appointed by the pre President Pro Tem of the Senate and nine members appointed by the Speaker. And then the Speaker Pro Tem and a, or the President Pro Tem and the Speaker will each appoint a chair. So there will be co chairs to this committee. The committee is to begin its work not later than October of this year and to finish its work not later than July of next year. The bill does allow for the task force to hire a consultant if they but the consultant cannot be a state employee or someone currently working for the state. With all that said, Madam Chairman, I do have two amendments that I'd like to put forward. And I'd like to start, if I might, with amendment number H6ABE1. H6ABE1. Representative Horn, you uh, can discuss this amendment. It's H6-ABE-1 version 4. You should have a copy at your seat. This amendment allows the committee to go beyond the, the narrow scope of, relatively narrow scope of, in the PD report, so that other funding models for elementary and secondary public schools, including charter schools, can be looked at in addition to the weighted student student model. That's all that it does is allows the committee to look a little more broadly as well as deeply. I ask for your support for the amendment. 
Is there any discussion or questions on this amendment? Do I see a motion? Uh, motion for approval from Representative Hart Hardister. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Uh, the amendment to H6 ABE-1 version 4 uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. I'd like to now go to the second amendment, which is H6 ABE-2 version 3. Representative Horn, you can discuss uh, your second amendment, which is H6 dash ABE dash 2 version 3. You should also have a copy of this at your seat. With that amendment now in front of you, I'm going to ask you to do something very unusual. I'm going to ask you to do committee work. I know that's really unusual. We don't do committee work in committees off times. We just take a vote. But now I'm going to ask you to do committee work. What I'm talking about is there's been some concern voiced about the a, the size of the committee and the makeup of the committee. If you heard from my presentation that the committee is made up of nine House members and nine Senate members, 18 members. And say there were any superintendents, any teachers, any outside other folks that might have a vested interest in how we delve into this issue. This uh, amendment that's before you reduces that, that number from nine in each house to six in each house, 12, but adds three folks each appointed, uh, three folks appointed by the speaker, three folks appointed by the president pro tem that include two superintendents and one chief, LEA chief financial officer. Now that's as non-voting members. Now the reason for that amendment, the way it's written, is A, to ensure that we hear from a, and, and have participation from those folks that have to live with our decisions. <coughs> but as well is that we, us legislators, we're responsible for, for casting the vote. We're responsible for allocating money. I would expect, and naturally, a superintendent, a CFO is going to be protective of their county, their system. We need their input, and whether or not you agree with this amendment, and we just leave it at 18 members as, as it currently stands or not, we still need to get that input. This amendment provides so that we can be guaranteed to get that, uh, uh, that input. There has been a suggestion, and again, this is committee work, there's been a suggestion that instead of two superintendents and a chief financial officer, perhaps we should have one superintendent, one county commissioner, and one chief financial officer, each appointed by the House and the Senate, or six other people. With that, and sure, I would, as, a, as a sponsor of this bill, I'd be very anxious to hear comments, questions from our committee members. Well, uh, several hands have already been going up while you've been speaking. The first one I saw was Representative Burke Jones. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Chairman and, uh, Madam Chair, as a co-sponsor of this bill, I would like Representative Horn to explain how you came to that number in the PED, how you came to get that larger number. Representative Horn, I um, just as I was reading through your amendment, um, I think my first um, my first thought 
was that you were you were taking six members off the committee who are elected uh, and directly accountable to the public and replacing them with six uh, people who were not but then I I read that they were serving as non-voting members and that certainly gave me some um, pause there um, I think that the comment that you made of um, perhaps having one superintendent, one county commissioner, and one chief financial officer, and it looks like they would be serving as uh, ex officio non-voting members simply to provide um, guidance. And uh, I think that would be fine. Um, you know, as far as the, uh, is the number of the committee, I understand and I believe that uh, it was your intent uh, to try to be able to put uh, a good measure of diversity on that on that board um, geographically partisan <coughs> urban rural you know all over the map so I, I commend you for that and um, again I think if you're, if you're going to make this change I think it probably would be a good idea to have a county commissioner on there because they are uh, elected uh, by their counties and they do have um, some budgetary responsibilities when it comes to education so I, I believe that's a good idea uh, Representative Dixon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Warren, Representative Lucas, and Representative Johnson, thank you so much. This is probably well overdue. And I don't think that there's any of us that believe that, that we'll hit this ball the first time we throw it up. We're, we're probably going to have to toss it in the air a couple of times. With that said, I really think your amendment enhances the possibility of success in this type of committee. I do not think 18 is too, is, is too large. I would ask you on the additional, the two superintendents, um, the chief financial officer, uh, the two chief financial officers, I think it would be wise to maybe give some uh, delineation that could be as simple as urban, non-urban, to get that kind of mixture in this representation because I, I think that everyone on the committee would, would agree that that we need the, the representation that's going to give us the, the, the best results and I think that we should lean to receiving advice from the folks who know the superintendents best and the chief financial officers, but these are going to be very key people in this committee process. And so we need objective, open-minded folks that will come in devoid of any agenda that may have been indoctrinated into them over the last five decades as it relates to school funding. So my suggestion, and I'll wrap my comments up, is on the additional people in uh, three, four, five, and six, that some delineation be given, you know, urban, non-urban, or some other method that has the potential. But I don't think it needs to be expanded beyond 18. I commend you for this. I uh, wish us all a lot of success in accomplishing this. One last thing. The report date is 10 months. And if I'm looking at it correctly, uh, the final report, the final report on the results of this study and development included both is uh, only before July the 1st, 2018. Um, the the, the, the next long session after that, am I correct, that'll be starting in January, right? Um, you might want to take a look at, look at that 
and move that final report date a little bit closer, or well, I might be exactly wrong. It might, might need to be further from the start of that. But, but 10 months is sufficient, but those are my two concerns. Uh, Representative Harsher. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I want to thank the bill sponsor. I think this is an excellent bill. Uh, on the amendment, uh, Representative Warren, I know that we deal with arbitrary numbers around here. We have to do the best we can. I think 18 makes sense, but I like this amendment a lot. And I think your idea that you mentioned of changing it so there'd be one superintendent, one chief financial officer, and one county commissioner makes a lot of sense. I think it makes a lot of sense to have a county commissioner since they appropriate funds. They handle our property taxes. I think it would make a lot of sense to uh, add a county commissioner. I guess what we do instead of having two superintendents have one, and then one chief financial officer and one county commissioner, I think that would be, a, in my opinion, a better amendment, and I'll be happy to offer a perfecting amendment if that's the will of the committee. Uh, and, and just to point out, it actually would be two, because there would be one each appointed by the uh, speaker and one each appointed by the president. Uh, Representative Horn, I'm going to add my two cents real quick. I agree exactly, but as a former county commissioner, I agree with modifying that and including the county commissioners. Representative Blackwell. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm going to be a little bit of a contrarian on some of this, if I may. Since we're doing committee work, as Representative Horn says, um, the bill itself is great. We need we needed to do this for a long time. Uh, I have a problem with the amendment, though, and it's this. I think it's more window dressing that we're looking for. It's like, well, we're, how are we going to act like we consider everybody's views? Let's put one of these and one of these and one of those. And I don't think that's really the best way to get input. There are 115 LEAs in the state, 100 counties with commissioners, um, and we need far more input that ought to come to the committee, I think, in the form of testimony for whomever has opinions, uh, so that it's not a situation in which one superintendent who had to have the right, who had the right connection to get appointed sort of becomes like our staff person and they're on the inside and they, I think, could end up having an inordinate influence. You're also subject to the criticism where you didn't choose the right superintendent or you didn't choose the right county commissioner. We ought to rely on the staff to keep us advised of the technical pieces and how things work operationally. And what this committee needs to do more so than having a three or four or six uh, people who are appointed so that it looks like we are representing different groups, we ought to be committed to having an open hearing process in which we let the superintendents and finance officers and commissioners, whomever, come and present their case and then let the elected representatives who serve on the committee make the, the choices that are needed. In that regard, I think the 18 and limiting it to just legislators is appropriate in this regard. Uh, the K-12 budget, as was said this morning, uh, is about 39, almost 40 percent of the budget. Lots of people who are interested in that. Uh, and uh, we need to have both parties represented. And so I would, I would uh, go back to the, letting the legislators do it but commit to getting that uh, input from commissioners and uh, superintendents and finance officers and the general public, if you will, uh, uh, through the actual process of the committee's work. Representative Horn, you're recognized to respond to Representative Blackwell. Thank you, Representative Blackwell. First, I'll point out there's certainly no uh, intent, attempt, or desire to prohibit or restrict the committee from hearing from anyone. As a matter of fact, I would expect, and I will be bold enough to say I'm going to allow the hard to be on the committee, uh, to ensure that we do hear from a lot of people. That's part of the reason that the length of the committee, uh, the committee assignment is so long, so that we can hear from everyone. The advantage I see of, of adding these other folks to the committee 
as non-voting members is they also are in a better position to ask questions rather than us getting into a debate amongst the public. One person stand up and refute something or bring another viewpoint. By having those members that on the committee, they will see the consistency of testimony or perhaps inconsistency. They will be able to, by way of questions, as well as advice as we discuss things amongst ourselves, provide the advice and insight that we as, as uh, legislators may not have. But I certainly recognize that ultimately it is, has to be our decision. We're talking about a lot of money and a lot of kids' lives, a lot of adult lives. This is a big deal. This is going to be a heavy lift. So the, any opportunity we can have to ensure the broadest possible participation without talking it to death, every opportunity needs to be pursued in my view. Thank you. Representative Richardson, you're recognized for a question or discussion. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I have a recommendation. I know we just said that we probably would include county commissioners, a county commissioner. I believe that we should also include a school board chair because they too are elected to oversee the school budget. And I also think that um, the state PTA uh, representative should be considered because many times when we uh, develop a budget at the local level and decide whatever um, resources are available or if a new school is being built in a particular area, we get parents many times coming to the meetings and with their dis, um, concern or dislike of something. So if we educate our PTA chair and our school boys as well about the budget, I think we may have a little less of uh, disagreements when we do have a presented budget. Uh, Representative Hurley. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'm agreeing with everybody. <laughs> but I really do think we, and I'm coming from a system that has two, a county system and a city system, plus our first charter school. So I feel we do need everybody involved, and I feel like a public hearing definitely needs to be held if, when we have this going, and I hope I'd like to be on it too. But I feel like we need the stakeholders, absolutely, every one of them, and uh, whether it's uh, 18 legislators or whether it's mixed up, I'm okay with either one, but I feel like we definitely need the public hearing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Representative Johnson? I'd like to address the um, Representative Blackwood's uh, comments about um, um, the needing um, picking special people to be on this. What we're trying to do is in a short period of time um, complete something that normally a commission would do. And a commission usually has input when they meet besides the public speaking or, or inquiries, someone there to assist them, uh, the legislators, uh, in their discussions. Um, but we're trying to make it somewhere between a, a task force and a commission without a commission being six years long. So um, I understand the, uh, your, your point. Uh, I feel that, that uh, what is, um, recommendation is, is probably the best we can do to get to a point between a commission and a task force. Thank you. Um, Representative Shepard, you're recognized next. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Horn, my question is, uh, do our Senate colleagues, um, are they know about this and they supported by what we're doing here on the House side, or have you talked to anything? I have talked. Representative Horn, you're recognized to answer. I have Shepard. talked to one of the bill sponsors on the Senate side who entirely agrees with, uh, with this uh, reducing the number of legislators and then adding in some folks, whether they be, and they were amenable, whether they be uh, two superintendents and a CFO or a superintendent, a county commissioner, and a CFO. So I have reason to believe that the Senate will support this bill uh, depending on how we, we send it out of here. Representative Bradford, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Th uh, thank you. I mean, this is obviously, a, I think, a bill that we all agree is necessary. Um, I sort of stack up a little bit with my colleague, Rep. Blackwell, in that I think the intent of 
getting everyone to the table is wonderful. I don't think anyone here disagrees. The question is, you know, what makes that blend of people? Uh, we just passed uh, an amendment uh, just a few moments ago, unanimously adding the depth of the committee, uh, including public charter schools. And for those of us, for, for those of us on this committee that represent uh, urban areas, charter schools are uh, very popular. And if I'm a charter uh, board member, or if I'm a charter staff member, or a charter parent, and I look at the committee blend on this latest amendment that's before us, while I would understand the legislators, those 12 people have voting rights and the others don't, I would sort of look at that group and say, well, I wonder who in there is going to be my advocate. And I think that becomes part of the issue and the quandary. And so while I wish I could you know, sit here and tell you I have some solution for it, I think the fact that we're talking about it so long probably says that we have more work to do on this part. Um, when you have 12 voting members, you know, I was on a joint legislative task force committee for transportation, and attendance is an issue. So when you have 12 people and you have attendance issues, there's less of a quorum needed. So I'm not so sure that backing the number of voting members down, and while I agree with you that 18 people is a lot, maybe the answer is to go back to the 18 and add four at large to be pointed by the committee to make sure that that committee can really perhaps explore what four or five other non-voting expert experts would we want at the table because it might it might create more people at the table but it doesn't create more votes and the lawmakers are the ones who actually have to vote so I'm sort of a hybrid where I like a higher number of voting part members but I also like the other stakeholders what I'm not comfortable is the blend and so I think there's got to be more work there again not really having a solution I just think the fact that we sit here trying to go who should be on here to make sure we're truly representing every organization and every you know class every urban every rural area is very very important and perhaps the committee themselves could do that on one of their first two meetings and then use some at large spots to make those appointments just my input thank you representative corbin thank you madam chair uh, a lot of good points made uh, i come from 20 years being on uh, our local county school board six years as a county commissioner and now here so i've had all three perspectives i can tell you this this study group is needed uh, uh representative uh, richardson beat me to the comment about uh, including a school board member because that that was the one uh, part that had not been uh, mentioned i would agree with uh, representative blackwell in that you need a broader input than just that one superintendent or one school board member and that's a great point so i think what you do is involve in the process the north carolina school boards association and the north carolina uh, association of county commissioners in that discussion those are two very important groups that represent the broad uh, perspective that we have across the state thank you ma'am versus horn you wish to respond just very briefly again i remind you it's not one it's actually two because they're come from both houses i just want to make sure people understand that and then they're reminded and secondly uh, I would expect that every organization uh, will want to appear to before this committee and I can assure you I will do everything possible to ensure that every one of these organizations, whether they be PTAs, parent groups, charter schools, doesn't matter, they all have a right and we have a need to hear from them. But at some point, we also have got to stop talking it to death and actually come up with a plan, not another study to sit on a shelf someplace. Uh, Representative Dow White, recognize. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I bow to Representative Richardson um, and Representative Hurley. They brought up both of my points. I did have one additional point. Um, when we say east and west and include that, and I read the, the uh, House bill would think is very glad that we have it um, but I think in the amendment we didn't I don't think we've been specific enough about where uh, the speaker um, the house speaker and the president pro tem would get their um, recommendations from in terms of uh, broad the superintendents and so forth and I think we just need to really remember when we say rural and urban that doesn't always mean east and west so I think we need to make sure that we include east and west Representative Meyer. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. I love the PED report. It's the best thing I've ever seen written on school finance in North Carolina. I very much appreciate it. Definitely support the bill. Appreciate the way that Representative Warren and Representative Lucas have tried to be inclusive about this process and very you know, assured by your comments about how you'd like to see it work. I don't support the amendment because I agree basically with Representative Blackwell. I like it when we ask PED to do some study for us. I like it when we hire out the Institute of Medicine to research some things for us and come back with a report. But when it's our decision to make and we're taking the reins, I like to, the people to know that we own it. I don't like to dress it up with window covering that we invited these people. We, that we do want to invite them to talk to us. But the committee is ours. The decision is ours. I would rather it be legislators. Representative Lambert. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Actually, it's been very good committee work. Um, just a couple points I want to just emphasize. I think Representative Dixon has made a great point. If this committee is not appointed until September 1, and then you have a holiday periods, and you have, I actually think the schedule needs to be looked at. I would be in favor of October 1, 2018 at the earliest. That's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I actually advocate as well for a school board member and a county commissioner. County commissioners will be critical in this because of their role in the funding for local schools. So I advocate for those as well. Representative Quick. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. And to the bill sponsors, again, I want to add my voice to those who are congratulated and thank you for addressing antiquated school funding in our state. Uh, my question is, um, no matter how we decide on uh, whether we're going to have non-legislative representation on this committee, all of those will be appointed by the speaker and the president pro tem. Pro tem. There, there will be no other method of those persons being appointed to this committee. That's correct. President Pittman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, have some mixed feelings here. I agree with uh, Representative Harster's concerns, and I also have sympathy for Representative Blackwell's concerns. And um, it, it, it's kind of a concern to me that by reducing the number of legislators, we reduce the opportunity for diversity from the legislators. You know, so that's kind of a concern. Um, but in, as far as adding other people to it, I mean, we could add principals, we could add teachers, we, I mean, you know, we could add parents, we, we could add and add and add people. Um, but I, I feel at this point I'm ready to support this amendment because it is trying to take a step in the right direction to improve this bill. And I think we should go ahead and pass this amendment with the understanding that when it gets to Florida, there will be more amendments, and when it gets to the Senate, well, there will be more amendments. This is not necessarily going to be the final version of the bill. But I think it's an effort to improve it, so I'm going to support the amendment. Representative Kim. I am, uh, thank you, Madam Chief. Uh, I have to agree with uh, Representative Blackwell in that I think we ought to, if we're going to put together a task force uh, and we're going to have the appointments of legislators and we're going to have hearings that will encompass all of our stakeholders, then we don't need to put them on that task force just to hear from them. I think, you know, we can, we can show favoritism by appointing those that we think know more about what we're doing than the legislators do, and they may know more. But if we've got a task force put together and we have a staff group that's going to give us all of the information that we need as legislators and we have hearings to hear from our stakeholder holders, then we're going to get a pretty good idea of how to vote on a recommendation uh, to reform funding of our school system. So, I hope that we would vote down this amendment and leave the part, section two, as is. Uh, thank you, Representative Gill. Uh, Representative Turner, you're next. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think I'll just pass on my comments. Most of my information has been brought up. Thank you. Uh, Representative Lambert. 
Representative Jones, I believe you wanted to speak for a second time. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, um, I agree. I think this has been good committee work. I think the discussion has been very uh, helpful and enlightening. Um, I agree with um, Representative Myers' comments and uh, Representative Blackwell. And just discussing with him, staff is actually drafting an amendment that um, rather than this amendment would simply say that it is expected that this task force would have geographical and urban rural diversity and furthermore um, there would be at least one member from the house of representatives one member from the senate uh, representing the minority party of their respective bodies um, i think that would that would be a good amendment that would clarify the diversity i am concerned i think even the conversation when it's turned to well we need to add a member of this group and a member of that group and so forth you're going to wind up with such a large group and let's keep in mind there's an appropriation here too but every time this group meets and you're getting it up to right now you know eight, six people coming in and if we listen to folks you may have 10 or 12 or more than that you're going to end up spending a few thousand dollars every time they meet you know, for that so i think it would be better to just leave it up and end it allow whoever wants to to come and participate but leave um, the membership as being the uh, elected members of the house and the senate with the amendment that's forthcoming maybe at the appropriate time perhaps representative horn would withdraw his amendment and we could look at the other one uh, representative farmer Broderfield. thank you madam chair I, I was along the same lines as representative myers and blackwell and representative jones uh, in terms of withdrawing the amendment and adding one that would be more inclusive in terms of the members of elected officials here this body because to me the whole discussion tells us that it needs to be that type of amendment do we would be talking about adding someone from the school board and adding someone from the pta and the charter schools all of those people can be at the table at some point in time before the committee give input and i think it'll still get the same end result so i think it's an excellent bill i want to program evaluation so i support this legislation and i'd like to see uh, Representative Jones come forward with his amendment. Uh, I have uh, two individuals that haven't had a chance to uh, speak for the first time yet, so I'm going to call those next. Uh, Representative Elmore. Uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Madam Chairman. Um, excellent discussion. Um, a fear that I have with any of these amendments uh, that are coming forward, if you look at the sheet that deals with the actual allotments itself, uh, if the task force is doing their job, one of the discussions of the meetings may be small county allotment, low wealth allotment, how do you deal with that in the weighted formula? Uh, that discussion would mean that you would need a superintendent or a staff person from that um, type system. But if you've changed the makeup of the board, your superintendent that's on this uh, task force may not be from those schools. Um, then the discussion, you may need attorneys that come in and deal with that. I, I don't want to see the task force get limited to the point that they can't target what they're talking about and bringing in the experts that they need on that particular subject. Um, what I think might end up happening with these type of amendments is you, you'll want everybody under the sun to try to meet every specific thing and it will limit the ability and movement of the task force itself. So. Um, personally, I would lean to just keeping it with the legislators as the board of uh, 18 and um, using your public comments and testimony uh, to be able to get the information that you need. All right, uh, Representative Brockman will be our, our last speaker. We're butting up against the time we need to exit the room, and, and uh, following Representative Brockman, Representative Horn will make a motion for you, Jim. And, uh, this will be quick. Uh, I am in full support of the bill as well, uh, but I'm leaning uh, towards the side of Representative Blackwell, and Meyer, and Jones, and uh, Representative Gill, uh, just for the very simple reason that if we're not going to allow these people to vote, uh, it, I don't know if it makes sense for them to be a part of uh, the committee. So, Representative Horn. Uh, thank you. Great committee work. How unusual. And how satisfying. I congratulate you. Well, here's what I'm going to suggest since I'm carrying the bill. I'm going to suggest we continue this 
one more meeting. Give you all a chance to think about it. Understand, we can't be all things to all people. Understand, we have got uh, that this bill requires us to make a decision, not another plan or study. And perhaps the best way to proceed is to leave the bill just as it now is with the single amendment in place. But that's the purpose of committee work. So I'm going to ask the committee chair to continue this one more meeting. If you all a chance to think about it, we'll come back and then we'll consider no amendments or an amendment or two. Well, let's not overdo it. You're going to get inundated with people coming to your office and want this, that, and the other person on this bill. Take a chill, as my kids used to tell me. And understand that we are we are going to hear from a lot of people during the process of this committee work. And I'm not in the business of guaranteeing anything other than effort, but I'll tell you what, I'll guarantee we're going to hear from a lot of people during this process. This is a big deal. Representative San Lucas. Thank you, Madam Chair. Please be reminded that the result of this will never be perfection for everybody who is involved. The idea is to reach a better goal than what we have now. And that's going to be our focus. With your input, we think that we can accomplish that. We'll have a better product than we have now. And that's what we're focusing on. Uh, thank you, everyone. Our, our meeting's adjourned, and we look forward to continued discussion at our next